is we're kind of in the state next door over in Maine. Small high school in southern Maine, about 700, 750 students, uh, about an hour or so north of the border. So a little bit about me, just so you can kind of tell where I'm coming from with the presentation. Um, I've been, right now I teach computer science and math and an engineering class at Kenny Bunk. My background, I was an engineer for about 20 years and I've been teaching for about 13 years. Um, the, the reason I put that up there isn't so that, um, to impress anybody or anything, it's just to let you know that I do have a little bit of a technical background, but you don't actually have to have a technical background to be able to teach an, an engineering or, or technical class at the high school level. So a little bit of background as to kind of where we came up with the idea for this, for this class, a project-based class, and where we started. The need actually came from industry. The U.S. has hundreds of thousands of unfilled jobs in engineering right now. And there's also new fields opening up all the time in environmental, biomedical, biomechanical, and schools can't keep up with the demand. There's a huge percentage of our students today that are coming in our grad schools from foreign countries. So about 50% of our students that we're seeing in grad school are, are from overseas. Graduation rates, when I went to school, they were particularly low, and they're still low for engineering. Uh, about 30% of people that start out as engineers actually graduate as engineers from college. Um, overall, the graduation rate's about 59%, so engineering is about half of the overall graduation rate from college. And that's actually a six-year graduation rate, so that's allowing extra time, two extra years for students to finish college. So it's still about 30%. When I went to school, and they still actually do this at a lot of engineering schools, they give the old look to your left, look to your right speech, where they say, take a look to your left, take a look to your right. Both of those people will probably be gone by the time you graduate, and it's pretty accurate. So um, that being said, we decided to bring engineering into the high school curriculum. Um, we've always had at Kenny Bunk a relatively strong math and science program, but we wanted to actually bring an engineering class um, into the school. Some of the challenges we had to overcome when we first brought it there is if you teach out of a textbook, it can tend to be kind of boring, stale, um, and you can teach all the, everything there is to know about the basics of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, petroleum engineering, but you're going to lose half your students in the first week. It's just going to be a, a boring class. Also, a lot of high schools, there's a lack of expertise. There's not a lot of engineers working in the high schools. There's not a lot of people that have worked in industry that can bring their knowledge in and kind of impart that to students. If you did teach a, a challenging engineering program, a lot of schools would consider that to be kind of a, a little bit too difficult. There's also purposely with the NGSS, the Next Generation Science, Science Standards, are purposely really vague when it comes to engineering. They're very strict when it comes to things like earth science, physics, chemistry. They have some very set standards. When you get to engineering, they have two or three things written at each grade level, and they're things like project management or learn how to, how to finish a project. They're, they're purposely vague. Um, our administration was actually relatively supportive, but this is a problem I, I know with a lot of other districts where administration has said, okay, we'll maybe give it a shot, but this is uncomfortable to us. We're not quite sure how we want to do this. And money is always an issue. Um, people think that engineering programs are going to take tens of thousands of dollars to get started. They really don't. And um, so as a result, a lot of schools are going to this makerspace concept. Uh, Makerspaces are wonderful. It's a great start into an engineering uh, field in the, at the high school. One of the problems is, though, makerspaces a lot of times tend to be unsupervised. Kids kind of come up with their own projects. And sometimes the projects are a little bit simple or they're a little bit too complicated. And a lot of times the person that's down there manning the makerspace doesn't a lot of times have the expertise to kind of guide them and, and keep them on track. So what we decided to come up with is a project-based learning class. And this was a, a bit of a stretch for us at first. Project-based learning is the way that a lot of the countries are going with, with engineering and a lot of times in math and science as well. So what I put on this slide is just some of the differences between a project-based class and a direct instruction class. Direct instruction, I've taught these classes for years. I still teach a bunch of these classes. Looks very familiar to a lot of teachers. The teacher is the one standing up in front of the room imparting the information. Students generally will work alone. Sometimes they work in groups with direct instruction. Um, information, again, comes from direct to the teacher. Homework is usually plentiful, assigned nightly, and it's a lot of times for drill. Project-based engineering is very different. It's, um, we work a lot of times in groups of two or three. Occasionally, we work in, in bigger groups. We have done whole class projects before. The assessments come in the form of not, uh, well, sometimes written um, assessments, but a lot of times they're a presentation. And you'll see an example in a little bit here of students giving a presentation at the end of the semester. The information doesn't come directly from the teacher. The teacher takes on more of a role of a coach, a mentor, 
offering advice, keeping the students on track, keeping them safe, keeping them from burning the school down as things goes on. And um, the information is often researched by students. There's a lot of mistakes that made. We, we talk about trial by failure in this class, and that's, that's very true as, as the class goes on. Here's a short video. The sound isn't coming out. Hang on one sec, I'll get the sound working on this. Can you hear it okay? Okay. So this is a short video that was put on by our Ed Foundation. You can hear some of the students talking a bit about our engineering class. You'll see a mixture of high school students and, and middle school and some elementary school students in this as well. But kind of get an idea of a little bit of what we're doing in the high school. and get back in. Yeah, I need to get out of the presentation real quick. And, um, Okay, so I'll just turn the sound off and you can kind of, we'll start pick up here halfway through the video. So um, these are just some of the projects we're, I'll, I'll talk about here in a little bit. We have things like quadcopters, we have a separate robotics program in the school. Um, and I'll, I'll get into these projects here in a little bit, but this is kind of a, just a video that our Ed Foundation put on for us. Okay, so the learning that typically gets addressed in any type of project, and the list goes on from here. I could put probably 20 more things up here. But um, obviously project management and teamwork. The, the kids will start a project. They're usually semester-long projects. So we'll start, uh, for instance, the projects we're working on now started in September. We're going to be wrapping them up around the end of January. So project management, um, computer-aided drafting and mechanical design. Our school this year is full up on SolidWorks. I'm not sure if anybody has any background with SolidWorks or not. In the past, we were AutoCAD, and we've used other programs like Onshape and things like that. But this year, we had a grant to go out and buy SolidWorks, so we're, we're full up on SolidWorks this year. Students learn electrical design. They learn quite a bit of coding. Um, we get into the, the program in C or Java or a variety of other languages. Um, test manufacturing. And lastly, we wrap up the semester with a, with a big presentation. So they learn quite a bit about presentation techniques as well. The typical student. Um, there really isn't a typical student in a project-based engineering class. We decided at our school to make this an honors level class. The reason being is we wanted students who could work independently and we wanted some uh, added rigor in the class. We decided to make it honors level. But essentially, it's open to any student. We typically attract juniors and seniors to the class. We do occasionally have a sophomore in there. If a freshman wants to take it, we generally will recommend that they try to get some solid works or a robotics class or something under their belt before they try to tackle the engineering class. One of the key things in this class, we have a large range of abilities. We have a few students in this class who are coding experts, and we have the bulk of the class has never written a bit of code in their lives. People come into this class not knowing a thing about electricity or soldering or engineering or computer-aided design and we kind of uh, get them the experiences they need as, as they go through the class. One of the problems we've had is, is, this is kind of an ongoing pet peeve of mine, we've had a problem attracting female engineers. We'd like to see more than 50%, we'd like to see a reflection of the population. Some years we'll get close to 50%, some years we're at 10 to 20% uh, female engineers in the class. Again, some have uh, some computer science background, others have none. Uh, there's another video I was going to show here real quick, but since we don't have sound, I'll kind of just buzz through this real quick. But uh, another video is going to show some of the things we do in the class. One of the things that you'll find if you do start a program like this in your school, there's quite a bit of interest from the press. We've had uh, our local paper come in. We've had the Portland newspaper come in. We've had Seacoast Online from the Portsmouth area come in. 
quite a bit of articles get written on this. You can see a few of the projects that, that we've done along with this. Um, one of the more interesting ones that I'm not going to highlight today is a, uh, a boat project that we worked on with our, uh, our Alt-Ed um, group that actually was a boat that we put some sensors and cameras on and they set it adrift out in the Atlantic, made its way over, almost made it to Africa, turned around and came back and ended up washing on a beach in Scotland. So we're currently working with a school in Scotland to get our data back from them and they're kind of fixing the boat up and are going to put it back in the water in a few months and see where it goes from there. So the program growth, we started this program in, uh, in 2014. The first year we did it, we had nine students and it was a full year class, so we started with nine. It was a little bit sketchy the first year. We had almost no money to get the program started. We were working out of an old math classroom. We had a budget of $3,500 for the entire class. We really didn't know kind of how we wanted to get going, what we wanted to do. Um, fortunately, we picked a good project that I'll get into here in a little bit. So students were interested. They came back the next year, told their friends about it. We grew to 20 students the next year after that. This year, it's our, um, we're just getting into our fourth year in the program now. And we're up to uh, almost 50 students this year. And we actually had to turn some students away. The class filled up and we just couldn't take everybody in there. So we did have to turn some students away. The equipment that you may need to, to run a project-based engineering class at the high school level, you can start very simply. We started with basically just some hand tools. And we bought a few soldering irons on top of that. One of the things we had to add relatively quickly after we got the program going was some 3D printers. And I'll show this space here in our, in our next slide. We're up to six 3D printers right now that are just constantly going all the time. This year we also have a great new addition that I'll show in a second is a CNC router. Expensive piece of equipment. This one was uh, about $11,000. We got a shop bought. Fantastic piece of equipment. This also is going pretty much 24-7 now. Um, fortunately, we have a great educational foundation, gave us a grant for this, so we didn't have to take it out of our school funds. Also, quite a few power tools you may need as the, as the course kind of gets going. Um, we are fortunate enough to have things like a bandsaw, a table saw, all the screwdrivers we need. One of the key elements to this is what kind of systems you're going to be running on with your students. Um, we started out our first year, we're one to one, we started out with Chromebooks. Uh, it was a big mistake. Um, Chromebooks are wonderful for some things, they're great for English classes, math classes. For an engineering class, there's really almost nothing you can do with a Chromebook. Kids need to be able to write code, they need to be able to draw things. I suppose if you're working in on shape, a Chromebook might be good enough. But if you're going to be using something like SolidWorks or AutoCAD or a real CAD program, you really need a Windows-based PC. So again, uh, Windows PCs were provided for us by the school. They're inexpensive enough now that you can outfit an entire classroom in Windows PCs for five or $6,000. They're not three or $4,000 for PCs anymore. Here's kind of a quick overview of our, of our space. Um, we're fortunate enough, again, that we uh, a bond passed last year in our district, a $42 million bond. And a big chunk of that went into building our STEM space. Essentially, we're getting a new school. Um, sounds wonderful, but if you'd seen our old, old school, you'd realize it was really needed. Our, our roof was falling down. Everything was leaking. So the first three years in this engineering class, we were literally working out of almost a shack. It was really, it was really pretty sad. But now what you'll see is we have, uh, these are three of our 3D printers that we have. We have three on the other side of the room as well. We chose to go with the MakerBot printer. We're using the, the Generation 5. It might look familiar to some of you. A uh, pretty simple printer to use. The bad side is they break a lot. I'm not sure what everybody else's experience is, but MakerBot tends to break a lot. So one of the smart things we did is we got the Maker Care that goes along with them for an extra, I think it's about $100 a year per system. Now whenever one breaks, which is pretty often, we just send it back and they send us a new one. So wonderful stuff. This is our CNC router up in the top left-hand corner. It's a good thing actually we don't have the sound on. I'm going to play a quick video with this. And if the sound were on, you'd hear this thing. It's quite loud. We actually have to leave the room when this is running. So we actually have two rooms that we, that we run our engineering class in. This is in the dirty room. And what you see being made in there is one of our electric guitar bodies. That's a Warlock guitar that's getting cut out of our CNC router. If you look at the, the bottom in the middle, we have quite a big space to work in in our clean area. We have about 18 PCs in that room. We have soldering stations set up along the wall and a big floor space to work with with a lot of lab benches over on the other wall as well. So quite a bit of room for our students to work. Another thing that's really nice to have, if anybody runs an engineering class, a, a project-based class especially, storage space. So up in, our, up in the upper right-hand corner, 
At the end of class, it gets to be a real problem if somebody's working on a project and they have no place to put it. Um, things tend to get left out. Things tend, tend to get taken from project to project, borrowed back and forth. So the storage space is kind of key. Some of the software that might be needed to start a class like this. Again, I mentioned we're full up on SolidWorks. We, uh, again, got a grant. It was uh, from Corning this time and uh, purchased SolidWorks. I think it's about $3,500 to purchase 60 seats of SolidWorks. If you don't have the money for something like that, Onshape is a, is a perfectly good drafting program. It's free, all cloud-based. Kids can save their work on the web and kind of come back to it next time. Um, AutoCAD is another popular one that we were up on for years. Um, we switched over from AutoCAD to SolidWorks this year. We still have AutoCAD and use it for our architectural design classes, but we have a few different classes this year actually using SolidWorks. Our engineering class is using it. We have a stand actually three sections of a standalone SolidWorks class, and we have a mechanical design class that's using SolidWorks as well. Some of the other software you might need might be to go along with things like Arduinos or Raspberry Pis, the MakerBot print software. VCarve is something I really didn't anticipate having to get. It's free, it comes with our, the, uh, the CNC router. I was thinking it would be kind of like our MakerBot print where you take a drawing and you can just print out whatever you draw. CNC router isn't quite that easy. There's an intermediate piece of software that everything has to get filtered through. You have to vectorize everything and it's kind of a pain in the rear end, but um, VCarve is another piece of software that you might want to take a look at. Some electrical design software, 1-2-3-D circuits is free, uh, wonderful software. Microsoft Office for doing presentations. Again, if the kids are all using Chromebooks, they can use Google Slides or, or whatever kind of Google software they'd like to use for that. But again, I put a caution down at the bottom to please don't attempt doing this class with just Chromebooks. It's gonna be a, a major headache. So here's a list of projects. These are some of the projects we've worked on in the last uh, four years in this class. And I'll kind of cover these one by one, but these have been a blast for kids. Some of the, sometimes the kids have picked these themselves. When the class first started off, I picked the first project, and what we do at the end of every year is we have the students in the class currently pick the projects that the students are gonna work on next year. So these, this is largely student-driven, and when it's student-driven, the buy-in has been incredible. Uh, we rarely will have a student that will wanna sit out and kinda of not participate. All of our students are pretty highly motivated. So here's a, a short list of projects that we've done, and I'll kinda of cover these one at a time. The first one is quadcopters. This has been an ongoing project that we do year after year. The first time we did this was about three years ago. I think we were one of the first schools in New England to try biting off a quadcopter project where we actually built our own quadcopters. It's a blast for students to do this. Anytime you can imagine a 17-year-old kid standing there in class with a remote control and actually getting something they built to fly around the room or, or fly outside, it's a pretty powerful thing. Also a little bit scary for some kids. Um, flying something that they built that costs a couple hundred dollars and crashing it into a wall or crashing it into the ground where they break it. It can be a little bit scary for some kids, but that's all kind of built into it. Some of the components that you need to, to build a quadcopter list up there, actually that's pretty much all the components that you need to build a quadcopter. They're really quite simple. You need an electronic speed controller, flight controller, a battery receiver, some motors and propellers, and that's really about it. Um, each quadcopter costs uh, about $150 each. The prices keep coming down on all the components. So you can actually do these relatively inexpensively. So the way we work this is the kids start the project, um, again, back in September. They draw their pieces, all the, the arms and the body, they draw that in SolidWorks. You can see, actually, that's an AutoCAD drawing that was done a couple years ago down in the, in the lower left. But they draw all of their components. Um, they have to size everything just right. The drawing actually looks pretty simple, but when you think about it, it's actually pretty complex. So all of those holes for the motors have to be in exactly the right location and exactly the right size. The arms, if you make them too long, it won't take off. If you make them too short, the propellers will hit each other. So everything has to be sized just right. Um, aerodynamics really don't come into it too much. You could actually fly a brick as a quadcopter and it would fly just fine. But you do have to get everything sized just right. A lot of trial and error goes into this, which is why the 3D printers are so wonderful. Somebody does a design, they want to see if it's going to work, they leave class, we 3D print it overnight, they come back in the next day, either things fit or they don't. If they don't fit, they just try it again and, and make them fit the next time. Generally, it takes two or three times through to, to get the, everything 3D printed out just right. I put the cost as approximately about $150 per quadcopter. 
It actually is a little bit more to get started. You need things like a battery charger. You need some radios. Um, our battery charger is about $400. It charges multiple batteries at a time. Our radios run about $199 a piece. You need a few of those per class. So the cost can go up a little bit just to get started. But once you get the program up and running, it's $150 a quadcopter. Generally what we'll do is at the end of the semester we'll tear them down and use all the parts again next year. So the motors that they use have been used before, the flight controllers, everything kind of gets used again. For the first time last year we tried it and we're doing it again this year. We're actually giving the students the option to purchase their projects at the end of the semester. So we actually had a, a lot of students take us up on it this year. But what we did is if the students pay for the parts, they can buy them at the end of the semester and take everything home with them. That keeps the money coming back into the program so we can you know, use it to, to buy new parts next year. So here's a quick video of, uh, this is about five seconds long, of one of the quadcopters taking off. And we actually did, do fly them inside. Uh, the video that I cut out actually has our quadcopters. Our principal is brave enough to stand there for our final one year. She stood in the middle of the room and we, she allowed us to fly the quadcopters around her head. She was kind of the obstacle we had to get around. So a little bit of a vote of confidence. So here's a video of us actually flying one outside. I'll play this one all the way through. It's a little bit embarrassing at the end. You can probably tell what's going to happen, but this is actually me flying this. Actually, let me see if I can get this working here. There we go. So we, you can actually, this is nice. You can fly them in the winter time. We take them out in the snow. And you see the students standing off there to the right with their video camera. There's nothing better than having three students stand there with their cell phones, taking video for the presentation they're going to do and just getting really excited the first time it flies. So we went forward, back, left, right. We're kind of testing everything out to make sure it works. Then I made the mistake of spinning it around. And once you spin a quadcopter around, everything is now backwards. Forward is now back. Left is right. Right is left. So you can see what happens there. So on the good side, the students just went back inside and we, I, I think we may have broken an arm off it. They reprinted an arm and we're back flying again pretty quickly. So the next project we took off, this is actually, we, we did this for a few years, was an underwater ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. Some of you may be familiar with the Sea Perch program. It uh, comes on a, a grant out of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute out of Mass. So if you, again, if you're short on money for your school, um, Sea Perch ROV is a great way to go. There's grants available. You can actually get these kits for free. We decided to, since it was an engineering class and our students are just kind of like this, we decided to take our kits and kind of go on steroids with the thing. So what we did is we took the Sea Perch kit which is, um, it comes with basically everything you see there. And we decided to add a, a bunch of things to it. So we added sensors to it so we could measure water temperature. We added pressure sensors to it. We put cameras on them so we can get underwater video. But the Sea Perch is basically designed as a, a competition between schools. It's kind of like a robotics program. So Woods Hole can give you a grant and you can go around and compete against other schools. What they do is they put these in a pool and they kind of go through these little obstacle courses. You drop things, pick things up, go through hoops. Um, we decided, again, we wanted to do something a little bit different with them, so we didn't compete. We wanted to go with cameras and things like that. If you do pay for these yourself, I want to say the cost is about 90-something dollars for a kit. They're not real expensive. If you look at them, they're essentially really nothing but PVC pipe, a couple of pool floaties, and some $2 motors that, that get attached to them. Um, one of the key things in this is just making everything waterproof. Yeah, That's question. Can you buy You, you can actually buy all the parts separately if you want. If you, if you get them through Sea Perch, they want you to buy the kits. But I think after you buy a certain number of kits, you can buy individual components separately. But they do want you to get some starter kits. Sure. So we actually took these to the University of New England for a demo. They actually have a, a ROV program there. So I was expecting to get some advice from some of their grad students there. As it turns out, our students were actually kind of advising their grad student on how best to do things like cameras and, and audio and things like that underwater. So. Yeah, question. Um, I went to UNH and uh, took a class and we built them and we're looking at the tools and they said they would come to the school and so it's the same thing. I yeah. wanted to buy their kits to do it. So. But if you look at the kits, there really aren't much to them. The, the one custom thing you need are the propellers or kind of a special shaped little <laughs> propeller. 
But those motors, um, you can get those. They're like Pitsco motors. You can get them for a couple of dollars each. One of the things, though, that's nice is the instructions that come with the Sea Perch kit on how to waterproof the motors and how to wire everything up. Uh, the other nice thing is that I think they call it a C switch, the little box that comes with it, all the, the little controls at the top is kind of nice. So here's a video that we ran in our class, and you can kind of see the things handling. We built our own test tank in the class. We had some old cubicle walls that were laying around. So we just strapped them together, put some plastic in, and filled it up with water. And you can see the Sea Perch driving around. This is our student, Ben, who's driving the thing. So you can see it goes up and down, back and forth. It's actually relatively responsible or responsive. It's kind of a nice little system. So our next project we bid off, we just started this one last year as a Pi Pad. I thought it'd be nice since I spent a lot of years in the computer industry and the industry has changed so much and gotten so inexpensive that students might have a way to build their own laptop computers. One of the biggest computing companies in the world now is this Raspberry Pi company. It's the most ridiculous name for a computer in the world, but Raspberry Pi is a Welch company out of, out of Wales. And um, they sell these single board computers, and I actually have one up here I can show you when I have some, some pictures on the next slide. It's essentially a computer that's the size of a credit card. It has a microprocessor on there. It has a slot for memory. Those cards go for about $35. Total cost of the, of the single board computer with the memory and a screen and everything else is right around about $110, really quite inexpensive. So the nice thing about this is you can add on to it. You can customize, you can buy just the single board computer, you can buy accessories for it. We decided to go with a touch screen with it. And what I had the kids do was 3D print their own case. Now the rule was the case with the, the form had to follow the function. So I had some kids, I said, uh, you need to think of what your application's gonna be before you build this thing. Some kids decided they wanted to do a lab buddy. They wanted to be able to take it into their chemistry classrooms with them and use this as kind of a lab assistant. Other kids wanted a personal assistant. Some just wanted a regular um, inexpensive laptop they could carry around. Quite a few of the boys in the class wanted to come up with a gaming platform, a portable gaming platform. So we let them kind of come up with their own systems. Total cost, we actually got the expensive screens, 150. If you get a less expensive screen, about $110 total. Um, oh, also comes with a camera as well. It has a high definition camera. So another one of the applications that somebody came up with is they wanted to be able to photograph the stars and the moons. So they came up with a, a photographic equipment that they hooked up to a telescope with this thing. So the, the applications for this are pretty much endless. Here's just a few of the applications and some pictures of them. In the top was probably the most popular one with the teenage boys was a, it's called a RetroPie gaming platform. Raspberry Pi has licenses through Nintendo and all these different places that you can get about 2,500 old video games. And you can download them on a RetroPie system for free. They give you all the ROMs that go with them. So you have to install a new operating system. You have to massage the software a little bit. You have to come up with the controllers. But the testing on that was an absolute blast for those kids. They got about two weeks at the end of the semester to test their systems out. And of course, they need to go through and make sure as many video games as possible actually worked. And it was a really good time for them. The one in the lower right-hand corner, we had one group that said, you know, I'd like to be able to carry this thing in a regular briefcase. I'd like to take it to a chemistry classroom. So they 3D printed the bezel that goes on the front, and in the case, they have a lot of sensors. They were using temperature sensors to measure temperatures of chemical reactions. They had a gas sensor that was in there that would sense some certain toxic gases in their chemistry classroom. And they just kind of used it as a, as a lab body. They also used their camera to take pictures of what they were doing in their chemistry classroom. The other one on the left, that's just kind of a picture of some of the guts. I'm not sure what they actually use this one for, but this is a battery module, about a $5 battery that goes with it. This is the actual Raspberry Pi right here. The one we used was a Raspberry Pi Model 3. I think they're up to a Model 3B now. They keep coming out with new products, it seems like, every six months or so. Um, what you're looking at there is actually the back of the screen. And I have some parts up here. Actually, I can pass this around if you'd like. This may actually be the one that's up there right now. So you can take a look at the back of this one. So quite ingenious uh, things they had to come up with to actually fit this into a case. So they had to separate the parts out and 3D print the case that went along with it. But this $35 computer is about as powerful as any laptop that's in here today. It has four USB ports on it over here. It has networking sound, has a high definition video connector on the side, has a connector to go to your panel, it has a camera. And, and actually a micro USB port over here on the side as well. So really powerful little thing for, for $35, and the kids really had a, had a good time with it. 
Next project we decided to take on, this was two years ago, and this was more of a full class project for engineering. So we had about 16 kids working on this project at the time was, was high altitude ballooning. I know there's some schools kind of pocketed around New Hampshire that are doing this. Um, we had a couple in Maine. Actually, I stole this idea from uh, Edward Little High School in Maine. But high altitude ballooning is a, really a lot of fun. So the idea is you send a weather balloon, essentially with a, a payload, a small five or six pound payload. You send it up to the stratosphere and kind of see how high it's going to go. Now to figure out how high it's going to go, you can do things like put sensors on there. So we put altitude sensors, we put pressure sensors, um, we put video cameras. We had three or four video cameras running off of each balloon. And we did about four different launches. We also had to have a GPS system on there. So when you launch the balloon, you don't really know where it's going to go except up. It, it could come down out in the ocean. It could come down out in the mountains of New Hampshire. You really don't know, so you check the, the satellites and you kind of see what's going on with the weather. And it helps you uh, with the GPS to track it. Now, unfortunately, up above 30 or 40,000 feet, you lose your GPS signal. So you can track it on your computer as it's going up. Then all of a sudden, your signal cuts out and you kind of just sit there for about four hours with your fingers crossed and hope that it picks it back up again. So if it doesn't, what we did is we wrote all over the side of the box, not dangerous, please call Kenny Bunk High School if you find, $50 reward. If found, please give us a call. And most of them we found with the GPS. One of them we actually got a call about six months after we launched it from a couple way up in northern Maine and said, hey, we have this thing. Come up and get it. So we actually got some great video from it. So the altitudes you get on this thing are really fantastic. We actually had one that made it up to like 126,000 feet. Question? The FAA was actually pretty easy. Um, so you're, you're, there's, you're restricted on where you launch. You can't launch it near an airport. And the FAA just wants a phone call. There are some rules, like you have to have a radar reflector on it, which is basically just taping tinfoil to the outside of the box. So as long as you have some tinfoil taped and you give the FAA a call that morning, we literally called them up and the guy said, OK, so what? Go ahead and launch it. We really don't care. The one from Edward Little that got launched, he actually got some video as it's going up at about 10 or 15,000 feet. You can see a jet flying about 500 feet away from it. So that was a little strange. Ours, we didn't catch anything like that. But So this is actually video of our launch. Um, let me get up to where it's actually being launched. So there's the outside of our school. It's just the parking lot. And this is kind of, so we're doing the countdown there. And then it launches. And you can see how fast this thing goes up. So it went from zero to about 126,000 feet in about an hour and a half. One of the problems when it launches is it goes through the jet stream where there's about 100 mile an hour wind, so the thing gets buffeted around. And on the way down, basically it goes up. I didn't mention this. The balloon pops. It goes up to 126,000 feet. The balloon explodes. And you can sometimes get some great video of the balloon exploding. But the balloon explodes, and it comes down in a little parachute, you hope. So sometimes the parachute will collapse on the way down. Sometimes it gets tangled up. So if the thing is free falling, you can imagine it would be a little dangerous coming down at 80 miles an hour, free falling down without a parachute. We got lucky all the time, and ours just went. So here's some of our video from the stratosphere. Um, our camera froze up a little bit. We can still get some absolutely beautiful video from up there. If you look up, you'll see the sky is no longer blue. The sky is black when you look up. And one of the other experiments we did I don't think I have it on this one. Is kids wanted to see what sound sounded like at 126,000 feet. They figured since the air is so thin that maybe things sound different up there. So we actually had a recording going the whole time. They played, um, I think it was David Bowie's Starman, played over and over and over again for four hours the whole way up and the whole way down until the, the battery died. And as it turns out, things surprisingly sound exactly the same at 126,000 feet that they do at sea level. And they actually did a whole spectrum analysis on the sound and everything as well. OK, one project we did, this actually goes back uh, to our start four years ago, was a robotic greenhouse. A lot of schools in New England have greenhouse projects. We decided, again, to take it a step further and have a robotic greenhouse. This was our very first project. It was a whole class project. We decided, um, rather than just have a regular hoop greenhouse that's covered with plastic, we we're going to install an automatic heating system, a watering system, and we we're going to have soil moisture sensors that would measure um, the moisture content of the soil. And when it got too low, it would kick on a pump and water the plants automatically. It was a great project. The kids learned a lot. The, robotic water, the, the watering system worked perfectly. The thing we couldn't get working really well was the heating system. So we were thinking we'd be able to keep it warm enough through the winter up in Maine 
Turns out in 2014 when we did it was like a record cold winter. Even with double insulation and solar things heating the, the water as it went through, we tried pumping the water through some rocks in the ground. It did keep it warmer. I think the real problem was the lack of sunlight. We didn't have the lights out there. So we kind of picked it up again in the spring and the springtime everything just took off and it was really wonderful. So some pictures of that. It was a basic hoop house, um, done very inexpensively through a grant again from our Ed Foundation. We had some solar panels outside. This gave us our power. It was about 100 watt, I think, solar panel outside for, for power. And that charged a couple of batteries. Batteries ran our pumps, ran our sensors, ran our Arduinos that, that were the brains of the whole thing. And that other large solar panel had hot water going through, or hot-ish water going through it. It actually got really hot in the spring. So that was our heating system. We pumped that down through tubes in the ground to, to keep everything warm. And unfortunately, we had to tear that down. The, the good side is we had our construction going on, so we got a new school. But on the bad side is once the construction started, we had to tear the hoop house down, which we're hoping to put back up again this spring once our construction's finished. So one more project that I decided to start our second year, and we do every year, is what I call the open project. This is the great one, I think, for engineering students. The open project, what I do is I give them a list of criteria. And as long as the students meet our list of criteria, they can build anything they want that meets that criteria. And this is basically all it is up there. If they meet the seven things you see up there, they can build it. So it has to be remote controlled, battery operated, it has to be under 10 pounds, has to have a major part 3D printed, has to have microcontroller or microprocessor control, and that's a little bit of a gray area. There's ways we let kids get around that has to have at least one moving part on it, and it has to come in at under $250 in cost. One thing I should mention is as we go through these projects, one of the first thing I have kids do on every project is come up with what we call a bill of materials, a, a BOM, a B-O-M. And this project, it gets to be really important. So they have to go out and research every single thing they need to build their project. They need to research every electronic component, every piece of wire, every screw, every nut, every bolt. And if they don't put it on their bill of materials, they don't get it and they have to kind of work around it. So it's not meant as a punishment for the students, but it's meant to make them sit down and really think out their project before they go ahead and submit their bill of materials and we order anything. So the device... It's an automatic page turning device. We have a student that likes to read but can't turn the pages of the book. So it'd be nice if he just had a little remote control in his hand. He could push the button on the remote control and this turns the page for him. They actually took this one home with them as far as I know they still use it. Hopefully they clean it up a little bit so you kind of see how that works. So it picks up the page and then this sort of looks like the page over the head. This is one you might have seen in the other video. This is a remote control hot air balloon. So the way they control it is they have four motors down here that are running uh, basically big propellers. And they run from remote control and they can make the thing go forward, back, and just put hot air in it. Not super controllable, it's really slow, uh, sluggish, but the kids had a, had a blast building it. And you can kind of see that one taking off a little bit here. And the whole basket underneath was all 3D printed. Some of the more fun projects we've been off this year. This picture on the top was actually taken just a little while ago. This is really popular with the teenage boys, is an electric longboard. So kids love skateboarding. We actually had somebody build the first one last year and took it to UNH with him. And he's, as far as I know, riding it to class every day right now. So he paid for the parts. Electric longboards, if you were to buy one on Amazon, they're about $1,200. We're building them in our class for about $150. So what they have to do is they come up with the remote control, the receiver, the speed controller, the motor, all the parts that go with those. They have to assemble them, come up with a box to keep all the, a waterproof box to keep all the electronics in. And this was his first test. It was a little bit slow. We had to replace his speed controller. But you can see he's really not pushing it there. That's just the remote control in his hand is making him go down the sidewalk. So we've done everything from that to remote controlled airplanes. And this was an airplane that was completely built from scratch. And I think this was, I think, the second flight they had on it. And it actually flew pretty well.
Something new we started this year in our engineering class is an electric guitar building project. There are some schools around that are doing this. It's actually growing in popularity across the country. We have a school at uh, Noble High School in, in Maine, out in Berwick is the first one that I know that started this in our area. Um, they actually get blanks in, so they actually get a guitar body in and have the students finish the assembly and do all the electronics on the electric guitar. We again decided to take it a step further and had them draw all their guitars in SolidWorks. So this was a kind of a big um, uh, SolidWorks project. This just came off our CNC router the other day. So uh, students, I don't have them today. This is somebody that I have tomorrow. I think this is modeled on a Fender Stratocaster. So they designed the entire thing using SolidWorks. You can pass that around if you like. And we cut that out in our CNC router out of cherry wood. So what they're gonna be doing next is they have to do a little bit of finish work on that then solder all the electronics. The test on that's gonna be pretty interesting because we don't have anybody in our class that actually plays the electric guitar. But our music department offered to come down and, as part of our project and, and evaluate the electric guitars for us. So this year we decided to do uh, Gibson Les Pauls. The one you see on the right is, I think it's called a Warlock. It's not actually a Gibson Les Paul or a Stratocaster. I think the one on the left is a Stratocaster. But again, a nice Fender Stratocaster sells in the market for thousands of dollars, and we're doing this for about $100 or so in our class. If you're curious about electric guitar building, you may want to check out the National Science Foundation. Um, their website actually is guitarbuilding.org. Lots of advice on how to get started with a guitar building program. And again, if you want to contact somebody, there's training if you'd like to go uh, learn how to do electric guitars as part of an engineering class. Uh, Noble High School offers one every summer, and I'm not sure what the cost is, but you can go out there and get trained. And over the course of five days, you actually build your own electric guitar that you get to take home with you at the end of the, at the, end of the thing as well. So again, there's lots of good lessons on this one. Um, there's, there's videos on that site that, that, that can help you along, but lots of uh, good lessons you can teach along the way on this one with electricity, sound waves, um, and how all of that stuff works as well. Noble High School's in Berwick, Maine, kind of uh, south central Maine. Is it, Karen, you know, is it Berwick or North Berwick? Noble? I think it's North Berwick. Okay. Oops. Oops, somebody's not just locked up on me. But I'll go ahead and skip the last slide. So the last slide I had basically just talked about some of the challenges with a program like this. So some of the big challenges you have with an engineering class. Number one is grading. How do you take care of grading in a class like this? If you don't have regular homework, you don't have regular tests. So that's kind of one of the challenges we had to overcome our first few years in this program. So the way we handle grading is I have milestones as the students go along. So they have a milestone. One of their first milestones is to get me their bill of materials. They have a milestone to get me their electrical diagram, their initial drawing, their final drawing. So I set these milestones as the semester goes along. One of the problems is students meet milestones at different times. So I have one student might get their bill of materials in the very first week of class. They work extra, they take it home at night, they do a lot of research on their own, they get their bill of materials in. Another student who might be doing a little bit more thorough research or moves a little bit slower might not have their bomb in for six weeks into the semester. So the grading sometimes, there's a lot of blanks in there and it's an uncomfortable feeling for other teachers. I've kind of gotten used to it over the years. But it's an uncomfortable feeling sometimes for administrators to see a bunch of blanks in somebody's thing for grading. Um, it just, it, it, and sometimes parents have a little bit of an issue with it too, but it's something you just kind of need to get used to. Um, administrators, oh, actually we're back on. Um, sometimes administrators are a little bit reluctant to start a, a project like this. The other big one I run into a lot of times is what if the project doesn't work? What if they get three quarters of the way through and they can't quite get it over that last hump? What happens if they fly their quadcopter the first week and it crashes and breaks? and it comes time for their presentation and the thing isn't working. My bottom line with things like that is really who cares? It's, it's a learning experience. If they get the quadcopter flying, that's more than they would have gotten in almost any other class. Once they see that thing lift off the ground, who really cares if it crashes after the first flight? Um, if the electric guitar doesn't sound perfect after the first thing, we'll come back and work on it again. We'll, we'll get it perfect next time. But the idea of being able to draw a Fender Stratocaster see it come out of the CNC router, take care of all of the soldering and everything else that goes along with it, and to be able to walk out of class with something like that at the end is, you, you really can't match it in any other class. Another thing you might run into in some classes is other teachers get uncomfortable with an engineering class. Students aren't sitting in their seats. They're up walking around, they're soldering. 
they're arguing with each other. They're, well, it's disgusting. But they're, they argue back and forth. They discuss loudly back and forth. Um, I don't have a set lesson plan when I go in every day. I have to go, and it, it's difficult. This is probably the most difficult class I've taught. You have to go meet every student where they are. One student might need a lesson one day on soldering. Another student might be trying to work the CNC route, or another one is having an issue getting their SOLIDWORKS drawing done. And you never know what they're going to get stuck on, and usually the problems they get stuck on are difficult. So it's, it's a difficult class to teach. It's, it's great that I don't have prep work to do at night, but it's difficult in that my prep work, instead of reading a book or getting ready for a lesson, I'm ordering materials. I'm, I'm taking care of getting stuff for class. I'm uh, setting up the CNC router. I'm fixing a problem that somebody had that day in class. So the prep work in, in a class like this is, is very different. Um, rubrics are a problem. Yes? Does every student do their own project, or are they working work in groups? We, I, I will occasionally let students work by themselves. I push them to work in groups. I like to see groups of two, sometimes three. Right now, I have, out of about 50 students in the class, I have two or three that are working solo. Um, occasionally, I'll get a student that wants to do something that's kind of out there, and other students are saying, I really don't want to bite that off. Sometimes a student uh, just doesn't like working with other people, and they just work better by themselves. So that's kind of an individual basis. I will let students work by themselves if it's better for them and, and kind of better to, for a learning experience. But I, I usually try to keep them working with, with each other. I, I try to keep it juniors and seniors. I do take sophomores. Right now, I've got probably six or seven sophomores in the class. I try to steer freshmen away from it, um, and not because of an experience level, but just it, it's somebody that needs to be able to be OK using an occasional power tool. They need to be OK with an 800 degree soldering iron. And it, just the, the, the kind of levels, I like to see more, more upperclassmen in there. Also. Uh, the math that they need for a class like this sometimes and a little bit of a programming background helps. So I like to see an Algebra 2 level in here or at least a geometry level. Um, you can imagine working with SOLIDWORKS. It's nice if they know what a regular polygon is so I don't have to sit down and explain that. And also just working with basic things like dimensions. So a geometry class or an Algebra 2 class really does help with something like this. But as far as teachers go, anybody can teach a class like this. I, I talk to people in my school and they say, I, I can't do that. There's no way. Um, you've got the engineering background, you handle stuff like that. Really, anybody that's got a curiosity level can teach a class like this. Um, all it takes is be, being able to be okay being uncomfortable with the technology. I go in there and I'm not an expert in our, on Arduinos at all or Raspberry Pis. I know a bit about software, I know a bit about hardware, but I go in and a lot of times it's, okay, let's you and I sit down and we'll figure this thing out together. And we spend 20 minutes kind of hammering something out. And sometimes it takes two or three weeks to solve a problem in there. Kids need to be OK going home at the end of class saying, I, I didn't get it today. But they come back in the next class or the class after, and then the light bulb goes on, and, it, and it's there. How many kids can you, I, you manage? That's a good question. Um, I, I try to keep it to under 20. Ultimately, 16 to 18 is a good size for a class like this. Our guidance department pushes me a little bit more every year. Can you take a couple more? Can you take a couple more? So I'm up to, I think I have one section with 22 right now, which is, it's too much. So 16 to 18 is, is kind of ideal for a class like this, um, especially if you're doing bigger projects, like the greenhouse project. And I really suggest staying away from those bigger projects. The greenhouse was wonderful, but what typically happens when you have 18 people working on a project, even if you have them divided up into groups, you end up with spectators. And that's something you really don't want to see in this class is two people doing a lot of work and two people standing there kind of going, okay, wonderful. So you want to kind of keep your numbers manageable. Yeah. Special permission for someone's materials you want to move the equipment? Is there a We really don't need any special equipment, so our special, special permissions. We do need to be careful with some of the things, like with the, some of the heavier equipment, like band saws, table saws. I don't let kids use things like that. They mark it out and tell me what they want cut, and I'll go over and cut it with them. Sometimes I'll stand there with them and kind of walk them through it. I don't have tons of experience with power tools myself. I, I wasn't a shop teacher before. So I, I tend to take care of that stuff myself. Mostly what we use um, are pretty simple tools in the class. It's a screwdriver or a, or a soldering iron. 
So with the kids that are using soldering irons, I generally will sit there with them for a class and make sure that they know what they're doing. And then I'll come back and check in with them as they go. But we, we have a lot of safety equipment in there as well. We have um, masks for everybody to wear, and they know when to wear the eye protection. They know when to wear the masks. They know that the, they, we have an automatic shut off on the soldering iron, so high school students forget to shut them off. Half hour later, it shuts itself off so we won't have a fire. So we are, we are pretty careful in the class, and we're, we're pretty careful about how we store things. Um, as far as OSHA requirements and all that go as well, but yeah, we don't really have any special permissions that are, that are needed for the class. Any other questions? Yes. You want to do yours first? Okay. So while well, the grading, like I said, we, we manage that by, by doing milestones. And the big milestone that's the bulk of their grade is their presentation at the end of the semester. So the presentation has to involve a live demo of what they're doing. And the demo can include a video, which is why you saw in that first quadcopter flight, they're out there with their video cameras. Because they have to have video of their thing working at some point, at, at least to some level. So their presentation at the end of the semester is the, is the bulk of their grade. Um, it's probably about 30% of their semester grade. But the rest of the 70% is milestones that they meet along the way. They have to get their bill of materials in, their electrical drawings their SolidWorks drawing, their final SolidWorks drawing, they have to have their initial bill done. So there's about six or eight milestones they have to meet as part of their grade. Within that rubric, is there, are there, um, are there soft skills included in the process? Like, do you ever include testing them on communication? Or yeah, so we actually do that as part of their grade. So um, their presentation, about a third or so of their grade on their presentation is communication skills, writing skills. Um, as they go along on their build, they don't just get a grade for their build. Part of that grade is a teamwork grade. How well did you work with your team? And also, I should mention as well, I assess them, especially for their project at the end. They, their project is made up of three grades at the end. I assess them, they assess themselves, and their peers assess them. So uh, there is a lot of that soft grading in there as well. But in addition to their peer grade, part of their peer grade is I have parents come in. So I, I invite parents in for the last day. So the students are all assessing each other, and I give each of the parents an assessment form. I give them a rubric, and I say, okay, here, go for it. Let's, let's assess your kids. Believe it or not, I'm pretty easy on the kids when it comes to grading at the end of the semester. They're brutal with each other. Um, the parents are generally pretty good, but the kids are really pretty, they know who works hard, they know who's struggled during the semester, they know who really had it together, and, and their grades really reflect kind of what they, what they think of, of each other's thing. So it's a 30-30-30 kind of thing. So peer grade 30%, my grade 30%, and their grade 30%. Yes? How successful are the kids in soldering? Because Yeah. I can't solder to save my life. Let alone solder. It, it takes some practice. One of the good things about working in groups of three, there's bound to be somebody in the group of three that's good at soldering. So I do a, a, about a 45 minute soldering lesson, and I show everybody how to solder, and everybody got it, and I make them all practice. We have about six or eight soldering irons in the class. Everybody practices for, for minutes. We, we go through tons of wire and tons of solder, and you see the trash can at the end of the day is just filled up with all the junk from the day. What they typically find out as they go through that process is there's one person out of the three that's really competent at soldering. The other two, I don't know if it's that they, they, if, if they had a lot of caffeine that day or whatever, but I'll show you the quadcopters. Some of the things you're soldering on the quadcopter, these tiny little pads. It's not like soldering two wires together. So you really, we have some magnifying glasses in there, and they're soldering some little things in there, which is good in that you're not soldering big wires together, but it's bad in that if you're sloppy, it's going to really ruin everything. So soldering, and actually that's one of the skills that the kids say that they really enjoy, especially when they get to college, if they're studying electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. It's one of those lab skills they don't ever teach you in college, but they kind of expect you to pick up on the way. So it's a nice skill to have. Yes? I suspect it's hard to make a soldering, but have you tried like progress presentations like that for We We actually have done that in the past, yeah. It's one of the things is, it, it, you're right, it's that, that's the big hurdle I run into is it's hard to make them stop. I can't, when they get into the room, I literally, when I want to talk to them at the beginning of class, I literally have to stop everybody on the way in the door because they're running to the cabinets to get their stuff out because they want their propeller spinning at the end of that class. They want their guitar to look nice or they, you know, whatever it is. They, they have something in mind they've got to get done that day. 
So stopping in the middle of the semester is a challenge. I have done it in the past and done interim presentations in the past, and the kids didn't like it. It, it just it wasn't well appreciated. Yeah. So um, one of the th nice things about this is it works. We've had uh, our, our graduation rate is, we have a great graduation rate. It's about 98, 99% every year. But the amount of students that are going off to study engineering go, goes up every year. Um, this is Allie Weaver, one of our former students, gave me permission to use her picture. And she actually came back and talked to our engineering class a while ago. She's studying uh, engineering, uh, biomedical engineering, computer science, I think, at, at BU right now. And she said, this is unbelievable. She said, if I hadn't taken this class and a few of the other classes I took here, I would be in the same boat as every other engineering student in this school. So right now, I'm like the only one in my class that knows how to solder, knows how to use lab equipment. And I'm really the only one that's OK being not OK with a project. I'm the only one that can sit down and really figure things out. Everybody else is really struggling through this process. And I'm kind of looking at them going, what's wrong with you people? This is really not a big deal. Let's just figure it out. So, any other questions? Karen, yeah. So, I'm just wondering if you want to talk more to refer to this program, how do we Sure, if you'd like to set up a program, again, we're, there are a few schools around Maine are doing this. I'm not sure kind of how New Hampshire stands with all these programs. I, I know there's probably some schools starting up some engineering programs. I have some cards I can give out to people after the presentation. Feel free to email me. Um, I do teach during the day, but I'm free to, I, I'm happy to come out and work with anybody in any school and kind of get a program going. Uh, this is only really a small part of our STEM program. I'm actually the STEM coordinator for the high school as well. And the big part of this is we actually have a STEM certification program that we're running through now, where engineering is one part of it, but to encourage kids to get more math, more science, more engineering, more STEM classes, actually STEAM classes, we started a STEM certification program a while ago, which has really been pretty successful. So we have three levels of certification, and kids are really shooting for these certificates now when they come into high school. But in order to get them, they need a little bit more math, a little bit more science than they would normally get, plus a few of these electives like a SolidWorks or engineering or digital art or something like that. Yeah? Do you have any suggestions for original that would feed into this? We have, that's one of the reasons we're, we're seeing some success is we have a middle school program that feeds into this. So we have a STEM person in the middle school. My only complaint is he doesn't see the kids enough. He gets them in a STEM class for, it's like an hour a week for a semester, I think. It's really not quite enough. But the more time they can get doing projects. So if you can get them doing any kind of drafting in middle school, any kind of coding. And by, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's a fantastic start. So if anything you're doing with Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, anything like that where you have like a little single board computer and they're actually having to write code, that is exactly what we'd love to see in a program like this. What we've been getting out of the middle school until we had this STEM teacher in the middle school, we were getting kids that came out really well versed in Lego. They, they knew everything there was to know about Lego robotics which really doesn't translate well into a real engineering class. They can think through some problems and problem solve. But what you're doing with like Raspberry Pis and Project Lead the Way, if kids can actually sit down and write some code, whether it's in, it really doesn't even matter what language it's in, C, Java, whatever language they can write code in to get something to work, um, basic, Fortran, it really doesn't matter. But if they can sit down and get some coding experience, and by coding experience, I don't necessarily mean scratch or, or something like that, but where they're actually sitting down and writing some code. That's, that's the big one. That plus some drafting experience and getting away again from things like Tinkercad and um, SketchUp and things like that and getting more towards a solid works or Onshape is, is a great one to start with as well. And middle schoolers can handle things like Onshape. It's, it's really pretty intuitive. It's, it's almost built towards people like a, a seventh or eighth grade level. Yes? The solar collectors that you um, use in the greenhouse, mm -hmm. Um, as far as the water goes, I don't know, the water collector, was some, that, that was left over from a previous project. I think that was actually home built. The solar collector that we used for the power was about $150 for 100 watts. And that's probably come down quite a bit now. I, I would bet for under $100 you can get a 100 watt panel, which will charge up a good um, car battery, like a 12 volt car battery. 
Yeah, the, the prices on solar are really coming down. The, the hot water thing was built by an old physics teacher who had been sitting around the school for about 15 years, so I really don't know the cost on that one. That's another lesson, though, is to recycle what you've got. If you have things laying around your school, take it, use it, and, and recycle what you've got. Any other questions? I'm happy to hand out again business cards. I'm happy to visit any school if people are thinking about getting an engineering class started. Love to come out and talk to people, come out and teach a class for you, meet with your kids, whatever you guys like. OK, thank you guys. Pull some cards out. Anybody like to take a look at